Hello. We have one attendee. So I, I will get I will get the, the instant who I'm going to mute. If you don't get to talk, no, you can unmute. <laughs> I'm gonna bang. All right, so we're just gonna wait, sort of. We've got a, about 10 minutes left. I'm gonna wait for totally to sort of trickle in. Actually, while you're here, since you're here, yes. I'm gonna practice like sharing my screen. Sounds good. Love it. Okay, so do you just see like the slideshow? I do. Okay. Perfect. Wow, I'm looking good. Oh, okay. So, do you see like my little face in the top corner, too, or do you just see like? No, I see your face too. Okay. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Well, oh, I, I like see you. we've got some people on Instagram. I see Mary. I see Naomi. So, hi guys. Uh, Are you broadcasting on Instagram too? Yes, I'm on Instagram Live too. So unfortunately, unfortunately, you won't be able to see the um, slides on Instagram. So if you want to see the slides, click the link in my bio and you can join the Zoom call. So then you can see the PowerPoint slides as well. But yeah, so I'm excited. I don't know what to talk about in the next 10 minutes. Um, there's my controls. It's my first time doing a webinar, so just making sure everything works. Yeah. Which is good. Zoom is currently like running our economy, so. <laughs> I've got a bunch of people out of the way. To... Oh no, no, what happened? I messed up my Instagram. There we go. So, let's see. Still waiting. I guess I can just talk about something. But my son is sleeping downstairs. Hopefully he stays asleep. But he might wake up and then I'll just have to let him watch some thing on the iPad while I finish. <laughs> But there may be a minor interruption. I'm hoping he stays asleep. So he's usually pretty good, but I can like hear him stirring a little bit. So a bit nervous about that. Let's see. Hope everyone's doing well, staying home. Um, I thought this would be a great time to talk about this subject because a lot of people are having difficulty accessing food. Um, you know, supplies are limited in the stores and things like that. And it's a time where we really need to be getting the most nutrients we can from our food because everyone's trying to be as healthy as they can. Um, so I just thought this is a great time. I think this is information everyone needs to know at any point in time. Um, but I think now especially is a good time. People have a little more motivation to learn some more um, on nutrition and proper preparation. So yeah, I'm excited. Oh, we got another another participant on Zoom. Welcome, Charlie. And I hear my son stirring. So I might have to go and get him. I don't know why I did that. Oh, sorry, Mary. I'll take you out. So, let's see. 10.52. So we still have a few more minutes. I see. Um, so yeah, Charlie's here. Welcome, Charlie. Um, hi. Hi. Charlie's my brother. This is part of his school for the day. So I'm happy to be Doing what class would this be, Charlie, in school? Mm, maybe back. 
Probably, I'd say science class. That's what I'd say. But all right, science would be the closest then, probably. <laughs> We're gonna be doing some science. Um, food science. If you've never read anything about food science, it's actually super. I don't know, super fun and interesting to read. There's a book. I took a few classes to do um, at ASU for an RD curriculum. But we had to read this one book on food science, and now I can't remember what it's called. I'll see if it comes to me, but it was really interesting just learning like why whipping eggs is important when you're baking something. Like what, what does that do? How does baking sort of work? That sort of stuff. So food science is fun. But we still have a few more minutes, like seven more minutes. Um, so I'm actually gonna go check. I think my son woke up, so I'm gonna go check on him. So I will be right back. See if I need to help him. He's actually awake. And I'll be right back. What is, I have a question on Instagram. The Zoom ID is 254-506-834. Mary, let me know if that works. So. That it's two five four five zero six eight three four. All right, and can the people on Zoom hear me? Okay, is every is the sound good? Just to check before we get started. I'm going to take that as a yes. I think I lost some amazing people. I need to pull up one of the things like that. I've got my hydration drink. Does, every, does everyone else have something to hydrate with? This talk is going to be like an hour. I'm planning 45 minutes for the presentation and then 15 minutes for the question at the end. But if you don't have something to drink, that's a long time to not have something to hydrate with. So we've got four minutes left. It's a good time to consider getting something to drink. I see Jesse. Is that Jesse there? I think so. Yeah, all right, we got someone else on Zoom. Oh, my husband who's at work joined. Well, that's nice. He's not at work, he's working from home, but he should, he's working. But he's probably gonna watch me in the background, which is very nice. So, still have a few more minutes. Um, yeah, and I said this before, my son's napping right now, but he might wake up. I'm hearing him kind of stir a bit. So if he does, I'll just have to get him set up real quick and then I'll be back. So I might have to take a little break, but hopefully we won't be interrupted. And I'm planning the talk should be about 45 minutes and then I'm gonna open it up at the end for about 15 minutes for questions. So we're gonna wait just a few more minutes to have, um, some more people who are registered, give them some more time to come in.
and fault. Let's see. And anyone who's on Instagram Live, I said before, if you want to join, um, if you want to join the Zoom, I won't be able. To, there, there's a presentation with slides to go along with this talk. Um, I can't share that on Instagram Live. So if you want to see those, there's a link in my bio to join the Zoom meeting. So you can hop over and do that if you're interested, or you can just listen to me talk, which is totally fine. Um, the benefit, if you sign up to that Zoom link, I'll be sending out an email at the end with a free guide to soaking, souring, sprouting, and lacto-fermentation. So it's an instructional guide on how to do it how to um, do these processes with different, there's a guide for grains, there's a guide for nuts and seeds, there's a guide for different kinds of beans. So if you wanna get that, you have to register with the Zoom link. So I have your email, so I can email it to you. Um, so that's another thing if you wanna hop over to Zoom so you can access that and also see the slides. All right, we've got one more minute. Got a few more people trickling in. Um, I'm just gonna wait one more minute till 11. And my husband did have to go back to work. He just popped in to say hi. So he can't watch, but that's okay. So I see Christina there. Welcome, Christina, on Zoom. We're just waiting one more minute um, for it to be actually time to start. Alexandra, mom's gonna join in like a few minutes. <laughs> okay, thanks, Charlie. <laughs> That's fine. So my mom is watching, not quite yet, but she will be in a few minutes. So, well, I guess it's 11 now, so I think it's a great time to get started. So today I'm gonna to be discussing how to increase the nutritional content of foods when resources are limited. A brief, my name's Alexandra Radway. I'm a functional nutritional therapy practitioner, and I live in Phoenix, Arizona. So, oops, all right, there we go. So just a brief overview of what we're going to discuss today. I'm going to be going through some of the basics of digestion and how even healthy modern diets are actually difficult to digest, which reduces their nutritional benefit. I'm going to be discussing how soaking, sprouting, and souring grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds reduces their anti-nutrient content and makes the nutrients in those foods easier to digest and absorb. I'm going to be going through how lacto-fermentation increases the nutritional content of fruits and vegetables, as well as actually grains and dairy products, too. Um, and then I'm going to sort of go through how to easily incorporate these traditional practices into your daily routine. And just at the end, I'm going to give some tips and tricks to minimize food waste in your kitchen so you can get the most out of the food that you have. Finally, I'm just at the end gonna give you some helpful tools and resources to help get you started with this kind of food and give you some ideas of books you might wanna read, um, different websites where you can find the materials that you might need to get started. And so yeah, so that's what we're gonna to talk today. Before we get into that, I'm just gonna give a quick, quick um, just tell you a little bit more about me. So again, my name's Alexandra. Um, Sort of how I got into nutrition is even from a really early age, as young as two, I had a lot of food sensitivities. Um, I would be getting, I got rashes and headaches and I was vomiting and we couldn't figure out what was wrong until my mom did a food journal and she figured out that it was artificial food coloring that was making me sick. And so basically my whole life, I haven't been able to tolerate processed or artificial food. Um, so that inherently makes a person more interested in natural eating and lifestyle, but um, 
I was always really interested in math and science, and I actually studied environmental engineering at MIT, which I like to joke is essentially nutritional therapy for the planet. Um, it's a little, I don't know, it's a little depressing trying to fix the planet. I just thought I wanted to try to help help people instead. So that's sort of what prompted me to, to change career tracks. And also I was unable to truly thrive in college due to the severe, severe hormonal imbalance I was experiencing at that time. I had really bad PMS, cramps, heavy bleeding, and it really impacted my quality of life for basically two weeks out of the month, which is like half the time. And it just, it, it really affected my ability to enjoy and experience life fully and my college experience as well. And actually I was able to restore my hormonal balance through a nutritional protocol, just doing research on my own. And just having that complete change in how I felt and how, my, um, how I was able to engage in life really showed me the power of nutritional therapy. After MIT, I decided to, I got married and we had, that's my husband there, um, who you can see, and that's our son, Marco. Um, and when I was pregnant with Marco, again, I struggled with digestive issues. I was unable to digest fats for basically the last three months of my pregnancy which was very difficult, which meant I couldn't eat fats beyond like a teaspoon of coconut oil, which was very difficult. And I also had crippling pelvic pain. I've actually been able to resolve all these complaints through nutritional therapy, things that typically um, the traditional medical route might recommend, things like surgery and just pain medication, all those things. I was able to completely avoid those by making nutritional changes and finding the right supplement protocol. Um, and just being able to realize that I could have prevented a lot of this pain that I dealt with um, through nutrition really made me feel called to pursue formal nutrition education. And so that was when I decided to um, join the program at the NTA and become a functional nutritional therapy practitioner. And I am so happy I did. So because of this, these sensitivities and health challenges I've struggled with have given me the passion for natural food and health that enables me to help women who wish to grow healthy families be free from pain and full of vital energy so that they're able to enjoy their time with their babies and small children while also pursuing their God-given callings. So that's really my mission is to just educate people so that they are able to take care of their bodies, be in control of their own health so that they are free to, and have the energy to do what they really want to be doing with their lives. Um, so that's just about me. Now we're gonna get into the presentation. So we always start, I'm gonna be talking about digestion as a foundation. So I like to say that you actually, you aren't what you, are, you, aren't what you eat, you are what you can break down and absorb. So sort of the basics of digestion. Digestion is the body's mechanical and chemical processes which allow it to break down large food molecules into smaller water-soluble food molecules that can be absorbed into the bloodstream. So basically, digestion is how your body turns the food you eat into the nutrients it uses for energy, growth, and cell repair. So it, you can see how it's very, if you can't digest your food, you're not going to have energy, you're not going to be able to grow, and you're not going to be able to repair your cells, which are all, everyone wants to be doing those things. So digestion is a north to south process. It begins in the mouth and ends at the anus. Food is broken down by excretion, excretions of stomach acid, bile from the liver and gallbladder, pancreatic enzymes from the pancreas. Absorption occurs in the small and large intestine, and requires that you have healthy intestinal tissues. Probiotic bacteria are also able to produce nutrients from the remainders of the digestive process, which if your upper digestion working well should just be fiber and water. Any imbalances higher up in the digestive system will disrupt all of the following digestive steps. After a properly prepared, nutritionally dense whole food diet, Digestion is the second foundation that must always be addressed. So with my clients, I always look at their digestion before I even work on anything else because if your digestion's not working well, it doesn't matter. I can give you supplements. I can do 
I could give you this great diet, but if your body can't break it down and use it, it's not gonna, it's not gonna matter. So I'm just, today we're really gonna be focusing on the enzymatic action of digestion because that's relating most to the types of foods I'm gonna be discussing today. So an enzyme is a substance that is produced by a living organism that helps to bring about a specific biochemical reaction. So digestive enzymes are responsible and necessary for breaking down the food we eat into very small pieces that can then be absorbed through our intestinal lining and into our bodies at a cellular level. We produce these enzymes in our own bodies, those are the, called digestive enzymes, but we also get them from our food, called food enzymes. And actually, you can sort of, a simplified way of thinking about it is that you can think we're born with like a certain amount of digestive enzymes. And if you're not replenishing those enzymes through food, your pancreas can get worn out and won't be able to produce enough enzymes anymore and you won't be able to break down your food. So it's very important that you are getting food enzymes in your diet. And these enzymes are a crucial factor for our overall health. So modern foods are incredibly difficult to digest. Highly any sort of processed food enzyme, enzymatic action is completely destroyed if a food is raised to a temperature above 135 degrees Fahrenheit. So anything that's been prepackaged, pasteurized, processed, there's no enzymes left in that food. Um, and so we can think it's pretty clear, you know, processed foods, I mean, people can get that those are, you know, not good for you and probably are hard to digest. That makes sense to people. But even healthy foods, foods that people typically perceive to be healthy foods, such as whole grain breads, nuts, you know, nuts, granola, cereal, beans, canned beans, if these foods aren't prepared properly, they actually will be very difficult to digest. Um, so we, I had a quick question about cooking meats higher than 135 degrees. So that's, that is okay, but the meats won't, you won't be getting enzymes from those meats. So you don't need to have enzymes in all of your foods, like every single food that you're eating. You just need some source of them in your diet. And also many traditional cultures did have raw meat in their diet. Obviously not all the time, but they did have some amounts of raw protein in your diet. So it is, you wanna look for places to get raw protein. I mean, think like sushi, that's raw protein. Um, but yeah, so we'll, there won't be enzymes in the meat, but you don't need to have enzymes with everything. You just need a source of enzymes in your diet. So, um, so our ancestors actually, these traditional food preparation practices, our ancestors actually learned them from the animals they hunted. So they actually, these practices actually mimic the digestive capabilities possessed by prey animals that humans lack. So I have sort of a picture here. We have, this is just an image of a bird's digestive system. So birds, they have, it's called a craw, which is like a little sack above their stomach. And when they eat their nuts and seeds, uh, they, they sit in the, it sits in the craw for a while. I forget how long, like at least 24 hours, a, long, a while. And that begins, that's like a first breaking down of that food. And then it goes to the stomach and then birds have a gizzard, which is basically another sack that's full of rocks. And that has the action to grind down the food. So our, our human ancestors saw this and they said, okay, birds can eat these grains and seeds. We want to eat these grains and seeds. We're looking for food source. We can mimic, we don't have these organs in our body, but we can mimic that process through soaking grains and then grinding them between rocks, which is how we make flour, you grind grains between rocks. And then we, I have a picture here of a cow's digestive system. So, and this is true for any sort of ruminant animal. What cows do is that they, you know, cows eat grass. We can view that, you know, sort of vegetables. So if a human wants to eat vegetables, we have to mimic the, the digestive system of animals that are designed to eat these sorts of foods. So when a cow chews its grass, you know, you've heard of cows chewing, chewing their cud. Cows spend most of their day chewing and they actually swallow what they've chewed. It kind of, it's got this sack that the food kind of moves around and sits there and then it gets regurgitated back up and then they chew it again and swallow it again. 
So you'll see later when I'm describing the process of making lacto-fermented vegetables, how this really mimics the cow's digestive system. And then finally, I just have a picture of the human digestive system. So you can see that it's very, it's got fewer steps compared to these other animals. So, and it's, it's a much smaller system, but what we lack in size of our digestive system, we make up for in brain size. So as humans, we need to use our intelligence and our ability to change the food that we're eating and prepare it and cook it. Um, we really need to take those steps so that our body with its sort of weakened, relatively weakened capacity to digest plant foods um, is able to get the nutrients out of those foods. And then again, I always like to remind people that we need to respect bio-individuality. Bio so just please remember, just because a food um, has nutritional benefits, or I'm telling you here, this is a healthy food, it doesn't necessarily mean it's the right food for you. Um, everyone has different things going on. Um, grains and fermented foods might not be healthful options for certain people, even if they're properly prepared. So I always say, always listen to your body when introducing new foods, and when in doubt, seek professional advice from a qualified healthcare practitioner. All right, so now we're gonna get into grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds, the benefits of soaking, souring, and sprouting. So what, what, why do we need to do this? What, why do these steps make a difference? So enzyme inhibitors exist in all nuts, seeds, grains, and beans on, they're basically they, they're on the outside of the seeds. All these things are basically seeds for plants. Um, and they have enzyme inhibitors that help preserve the plant seed until it has the right conditions for it to sprout and grow. Because the main goal of these plants is not to feed humans. The main goal of these plants is to reproduce. Um, just like it sounds, enzyme inhibitors act to inhibit enzymes. Um, and that means that they actually can also inhibit your body's ability to use its own enzymes to break down that particular food and use it. Enzymes inhibitors can also put stress on the pancreas which is responsible for, as we said earlier, producing the enzymes we need to break down our food, as well as the hormones we need to regulate blood sugar. And I'd just like to point out here that these organs of digestion have other functions. The, um, and so if, you're di the, if, if the food you're having is causing digestive stress, you're going to see effects in other systems, whether it be your hormone regulation, your blood sugar regulation, everything's connected. So that's why um, digestion doesn't only impact, you know, how your tummy feels. It's really much deeper than that. Another um, thing that's of concern in grains is an acid called phytic acid. Um, and it's present in nuts, seeds, grains, and beans, but it's found in a greater quality quantity in grains and beans. It again, sort of like the enzyme inhibitors, acts as a preservative to prevent premature germination, and also it stores nutrients um, that the plant can then use later when it's growing. So it binds with calcium, magnesium, copper, iron, and zinc in the intestinal tract, tract and blocks their absorption, which can result in mineral deficiencies. And this is especially the case if you're a person that's on a plant-based diet, um, because meat doesn't have these um, anti-nutrients in it, so the those minerals are more bioavailable, but if you're only getting your minerals from plants, you really need to take these extra steps to break down the phytic acid. Otherwise, you will be developing mineral deficiency. Oh, mineral deficiency. Um, it, can, it can be someone's got, I gotta, someone's got their sound on. All right. Um, it can be reduced by soaking with an acidic medium, such as lemon juice, apple cider vinegar, or whey. Um, and then, or by sprouting and then subsequent cooking. So phytase is the enzyme that breaks down phytic acids. This is an enzyme plants actually have. Um, it is found in plants in, in varying amounts depending on which grain. For example, rye has a considerable amount of phytase, whereas oats has very little. So this is good to know because um, you need to take 
For example, even soaking oats, just soaking oats by itself, they don't have enough phytase in them to break down the phytic acid. But if you were to add just a little bit of rye to your oats or buckwheat if you're gluten-free, then that would just provide the extra phytase that you need so that the phytic acid in the oats would be broken down. Oops. All right, so this, is, so this is just sort of the basic method of soaking. Um, if you're doing nuts and seeds, you're gonna wanna dissolve some salt in the water. If you're doing grains, you don't need to do salt. You're gonna use um, an acidic substance, such as lemon juice, apple cider vinegar, or whey. So you basically just place your nuts, seeds, or grains in water, add enough water to cover them, leave in a warm place, generally overnight, and then in the morning, or whenever you're ready to prepare, you just drain the water and cook right away. You can also store them in the refrigerator for about five days. Or if, you know, if it's something you want to cook it later, or if it's like nuts, it's something you want to snack on later, you can dehydrate the water out so they can be stored dry for a longer period of time. So you can do this by using a dehydrator or in a warm oven. Again, um, when I'm talking about those enzymes, a warm oven typically is about 150 degrees Fahrenheit, so that's actually a little too warm to preserve the enzyme action. So if, you, if you're really interested in doing this step, I recommend using a dehydrator where you can control the temperature. Another thing you can soak, you don't actually, and this took me a while to figure out, but you can just soak your pre-mealed flour. So when you're making breads, pancakes, or muffins, you can pre-soak the flour um, to maximize its nutrient density and digestibility. So this process is also simple. Um, it's very similar to soaking the grains. You take, you, um, you have a glass bowl, you measure out, the flour that you need for your, for your recipe, and then any non-perishable liquids, so such as the water, or if you're using like a buttermilk or whatever, and there, there's a reason to use buttermilk, and then you also add the sweetener. And then after that, you stir in one tablespoon of acidic medium for every cup of liquid used. You cover that with a clean dish towel, and you allow it to soak overnight. So, and up to 24 hours, you can let it soak. And then you proceed with the following of the recipe as you normally would. So you can add the eggs, the milk, bananas, if you're making banana bread, and then you cook as directed. Sometimes soaked grains take slightly longer to cook, so just make a note of that, that you might need to slightly extend your cooking time. But this is a great way to, and it's easy to, you know, increase the nutritional content um, of baked goods as well. So an interesting note on brown rice, um, basically, if you soak it just in an acidic medium, it breaks down the phytic acid content by about half. Um, but if you take the step to um, add a fermentation process, um, it, you can bring the phytic acid content down to almost zero. So I think this is pretty, pretty cool. It's very similar to the previous steps, except after the first soak, you reserve 10% of the liquid that's left over after soaking. Um, and then you make your first batch of rice. The next time you're soaking, you add that 10% that you've reserved to the new soaking water. Um, and then you just keep repeating this cycle. Every time you soak your brown rice, just reserve that 10% and then add it to the next batch. And so over time, this will um, improve the ability the uh, breakdown of the phytic acid until it's over 96% or more of the phytic acid will be degraded at 24 hours. So that's just another um, cool process to think about. So after soaking, we have sprouting. So sprouting, I think, is an incredible process. It's really fun to do at home. Um, I'm sure we all did that science experiment when we were little where we had some seeds and we had to you know, watch them sprout and then grow something. I know I did that in like fifth grade. But um, so many of the foods we eat begin their life as sprouts. Sprouting is simply the way that a seed cracks open for the first time and sends a root or leaf stalk poking upward out of the soil and into the open air. Because the sprouting stage of growth is so unique in the life of the plant, 
um, there's been special interest in the potential health benefits that might be associated with this stage of growth. In general, sprouts are often more concentrated in certain nutrients, including some key antioxidants when compared with fully mature plants. So um, sprouting is a great process. It's easy to do at home and it's a great thing. Um, I mean, it's basically how, you know, people survived in the past when there'd be long periods of time where you wouldn't be able to access fresh food. If you could grow your own, make your own sprouts, um, you could get your vitamin C, you wouldn't get scurvy, and it's just a great process to have. It's a great um, way to have some emergency preparedness. If you have some sprouting seeds on hand, you don't need to stress if, you know, the store is fully out of fresh produce. You can easily grow your own sprouts that you can use at home. So the benefits of sprouting, it creates numerous enzymes and vitamins, including B2, B5, B6, beta carotene, and vitamin E. It yields a vitamin content up to 30 times higher than those found in the mature plant. It further neutralizes enzyme inhibitors and further reduces phytic acid content. So if you're just soaking your grains, that's good. That will break down those enzyme inhibitors and phytic acids um, to varying amounts depending on the grain. But then if you take the step, the second step to sprout your grains after you've done that initial soaking process, you will even further neutralize those enzyme inhibitors and phytic acid. It also increases the bioavailability of minerals and proteins in your grains and it changes the composition of the grain starch molecules and converts them into vegetable sugars. And this actually makes the grains, again, the starch is hard to break down. The vegetable sugars are easier to digest. Um, a few things to note, alfalfa sprouts um, have been made popular in the health sort of food world, but they contain a particular amino acid, cannabanine, that is toxic when consumed in large amounts and actually can be damaging to the immune system. So they should be consumed infrequently in small amounts if you consume them at all. Um, and this isn't true of full-sized alfalfa, it's just true of the sprout. On eating sprouts raw, the FDA warns against eating any raw sprouts because they have, there have been E. coli and salmonella outbreaks traced to contaminated seeds. Cooking your sprouts is the way to guard against this. Um, if you notice any sprouts are giving you digestive distress, you can also cook them to increase digestibility. My note on this is that certain sprouts, um, I would say things like broccoli sprouts, vegetable sprouts as opposed to grain sprouts are sort of easier to digest. And those are the kind that you could consider eating raw, like on a salad or a sandwich. But again, if you're doing that, you have to be very careful. You want to be preparing them yourself and making sure that you're taking appropriate steps to maintain um, cleanliness in your preparation. And then you want to have them in small quantities. You don't want to have large quantities of raw sprouts because they can cause some digestive distress. But um, a really easy way, if you lightly steam the sprouts, for example, mung bean sprouts, they're really nice to add to like a rice dish or like a noodle dish. Those can be lightly steamed, and then you don't have to worry about the E. coli or salmonella, and you, by lightly steaming, you maintain more of their nutritional content. So the basic method of sprouting is you're going to fill a mason jar one-third of the way full with any grain or seed, and then you fill the remainder of the jar with filtered water and a half teaspoon of sea salt and screw on um, a sprouting lid. So a sprouting lid is basically any kind of lid that has a bunch of holes poked in it so that allows the water to drain out. Um, I recommend you can, the simplest way is you can just take a little bit of cloth and screw it you know, underneath the mason jar lid, that works. What works better is like a plastic lid with holes and I actually recommend plastic over metal. I typically recommend like stainless steel, but especially if you're in Arizona, the it'll just rust too much because it's sitting in water all the time. So I recommend a BPA free, plastic and that makes it really easy to frequently rinse the sprouts. It's really important when you're making sprouts, you want to rinse them as frequently as possible um, around three to four times a day and that helps prevent any bad bacteria from growing. 
So you first allow the seeds to soak overnight, and then in the morning, you pour off the water and you rinse the seeds well. And if you have you know, a special sprouting top, you can do this without removing the top. You then invert the jar and let it sit at an angle so it can drain, but also air can circulate. The seeds should be rinsed every few hours or at least twice per day. Um, depending on what you're sprouting, the sprouts will be ready in one to four days when their tails have reached about a quarter inch in length. Some sprouts you can let go longer. Um, you wanna keep them out of direct sunlight to prevent the sprouts from leafing. Um, when you're ready to prepare, you wanna rinse them very well, shake out excess moisture, um, and replace the sprouting lid with just a normal mason jar lid. And then you can store the sprouts in the refrigerator for up to five days. And another note, if you're making a large quantity of sprouts, another way instead of using a jar is just using like a colander or a, um, a sieve and just keeping the sprouts in there. And then it's easier to rinse. You just leave that on a plate and then you cover with a towel. So, so after sprouting, we're going to be talking about soured breads. So this is another process that you can use to greatly increase the nutritional content of your grains. So sourdough is a culture of yeast and beneficial bacteria that occur naturally in bread flour and dough. Real sourdough is very simple. You take some starter, which is just yeast, Starter, it's just flour and water that's been carefully fed over several days with more flour and water, which, allowing, which allows the natural yeast and bacteria that's already on that flour to increase in number. Um, you add some fresh flour and water to that stout starter, and then you just leave it out to ferment um, for several hours until the yeast population has grown. Um, and then when you're done, you just take a little bit of your dough and you save it to make your next batch of bread. So before commercially produced yeast was made available, which was basically like the turn of the um, 20th century, this was how all bread was made because getting purified yeast, uh-oh, all right, one second, my son woke up. Sorry, I think he fell back asleep, but I might. No, he didn't. I'll be right back. Come on. Can say hi to the people real quick? Uh, right. Say hi, All right, I'm sorry. Sorry about that delay. Let me pick up where I left off, which I need to remember now. <clears throat> so, where was I? So before commercially produced yeast, this was the way that all bread was baked because that was the only way you could get yeast. Um, 
or like really purified yeast was just exorbitantly expensive. So this is how all bread's been made traditionally, and it just takes a little longer. Um, so it takes, you know, 12 hours for the bread to rise instead of two hours. Um, when, and again, it's the time that allows the fermentation process to occur. And this, this is what's, when you have the, when you have enough time to allow that process to occur, that's what transforms the main ingredient, which is the flour, into a really nutrient dense food, which is the sourdough bread. So some of the benefits of sourdough is the lactic acid bacteria can actually break down gluten proteins that are difficult to digest and mitigate some of the negative effects of gluten. So I know every um, gluten's a big topic right now, and clearly, you know, even for someone with celiac, even a sourdough bread probably isn't something they can tolerate. But for a lot of people, if you're noticing that bread is giving you problems, before cutting it out, try sourdough because there are a lot of nutritional benefits to wheat. Um, and it's just, it's a really delicious nutrient source. But, um, so yes, I had another question. If you're stuck in quarantine and all you have is flour and you weren't able to get yeast, you can make sourdough without yeast. You don't need to add additional yeast. All you need is the flour, water, and salt. It'll take, you can make your own starter. Um, it takes about a week. If you just, you start with flour and water, you leave it out overnight in the morning, you take away half of what's been there before, you add a little more flour, add a little more water, leave it out for another day, you repeat that process over seven days, and at the end, you have a starter that you can bake bread with. So this is a great skill to learn. Um, so you can make your own bread, even if there's no yeast, and all you have is flour. So yes, Maddie, that's all, that's all you need. Oops, went too far. So again, back to gluten is um, just try, it's worth trying sourdough because there's no need to just cut out all bread products if you actually could really tolerate them if they were prepared properly. And also using like an ancient grain such as a spelt or a teff, a kamut or rye, um, which are just more um, ancient, just older versions of wheat. They have a lower gluten content and you know, combining a lower gluten content to begin with, plus the process of, of sourdough, becoming a sourdough bread could make that really easy to tolerate for certain people. Um, the lactic acid bacteria also produce beneficial compounds that can often survive heating, such as antioxidants, cancer preventative, a cancer preventative peptide lunacin, and also anti-allergenic substances. Um, and again, the several hours of fermentation with sourdough is sufficient to neutralize phytic acid and make the minerals more bioavailable. So you don't have to worry if you just have normal flour. Um, so you know the you know the, the the grains before they're milled into flour, they weren't soaked, they weren't sprouted. You can still take that normal flour and turn it into a sourdough bread, and you know that the phytic acid has been broken down. Um, so. Also, this long fermentation can reduce levels of an amino acid, asparagine, that's typically present in the crust of breads. And it's a precursor to acrylamide formation, which is a su suspected carcinogen. And finally, these breads have a lower glycemic index. So the lactic acid bacteria produce organic acids that under the heat of baking, um, cause interactions that actually reduce the starch availability. So a sourdough bread is not going to spike your blood sugar in the same way that a, you know, a standard bread would. Um, and so it can be a really great option for people that have, you know, are trying to watch their glycemic index, their blood sugar, lower their carbs. Um, it just can be a great thing that you can still enjoy some bread. And I always say your sourdough bread always have um, butter with your bread. You need to have, when you're having a carbohydrate, you need to have a, a good quality fat with it. I love grass-fed butter, preferably raw, preferably cultured. Um, that is an amazing meal. Just some, you know, sourdough with some grass-fed butter, butter is the perfect accompaniment to any meal.
So, so now we've kind of moved, we've gone through sort of our processes for grains. We're gonna now be talking about lactofermentation. And this is basically how you can put friendly microbes to work for you to grow nutrients from the food you have in the comfort of your own home. So there's a multicultural history of fermented foods. Basically all traditional cultures use fermented foods um, because one, this process preserves foods and it was really the main way for food preservation before the era of refrigeration. But it also has such amazing nutritional benefits that, and cultures recognize this. So Korea has kimchi, we've all heard of kimchi. Mexico has cortido, um, which is a blend of cabbage, carrots, onions, and other vegetables. Japan has gari, um, which is from young tender ginger root. Russia has kvass, which is a drink that can either be made from beetroot or from rye. Asia has nado, tempeh, and miso, which is all made from soybeans. And a note, if you are a person that eats soybeans, I recommend the only type of soybean that you should eat are these um, these traditional preparations that have undergone a long fermentation process. Um, India has chutney, which is blends of fruits and spices, and Africa has in injera, a flatbread made from teff grain. Um, yes, so the benefits of, of fermentation. So it provides a nutritionally superior method of preserving foods. So when foods are preserved in more modern ways like pressure canning. Um, that's the main, pressure, really pressure canning. That's how we make things shelf stable. That kills off all the enzymatic action. Those foods are really, they're just dead and have lost a lot of their nutritional value. Um, but this process actually increases the amount of food enzymes present as well as the amount of good bacteria i.e. probiotics. The additional enzymes help you digest and thus assimilate your food and nutrients, and it also helps to nourish and repair the gut by repopulating it with beneficial bacteria and encouraging a proper pH balance or acidity balance in your gut. So how, how does this process work? So lactofermentation refers to the many species of lactic acid producing bacteria found in fermented foods. So fermentation is much, it's much different than rotting. The key difference is the controlled environment, which is typically a brine, which is salty water, and which is salty enough to kill off the harmful bacteria, but leaves behind the lactobacilli, which are the good bacteria. So lactobacillus organisms begin converting lactose and other sugars present in the food into lactic acid. This creates an acidic environment that safely preserves the vegetables and gives lacto-fermented foods their distinctive tangy flavor. And so these bacteria were first discovered in dairy products. That's why they're called lactobacillus. Um, but the same, so things like yogurt or kefir, um, but it's the same bacteria that does all of these processes. So during the fermentation process, certain microbes produce small amounts of some B vitamins, such as thiamine, riboflavin, and niacin, and even in some cases, vitamin B12. Fermentation also increases levels of vitamins A, C, and K in some foods and improves their mineral bioavailability. So this is really the incredible power of lactofermentation is that not only does it provide you with super critical enzymes, that help you break down your food, and then probiotic bacteria that support your gut and make you more able to absorb your food. But the bacteria themselves actually take, um, actually eat the, you know, when they're breaking down and fermenting the food, they produce more vitamins. So you can actually get more nutrients than you had with, than compared to the vegetables you just started with, which is so cool. So for example, a cup of cabbage has around 30 milligrams of vitamin C, whereas a cup of sauerkraut can have up to 600 to 700 milligrams per cup. And so um, that, I think that's just really incredible, and especially you know, in terms of supporting your immune system. If you're ever in a situation where all the stores are sold out of vitamin C, 
Unfortunately, a cup of sauerkraut is a lot, so you really, you probably can't get like a therapeutic dose of vitamin C from sauerkraut, but you can still take, you can still produce a lot of vitamin C just in your home, which I think is super cool. Um, and it's really, it's a really easy process. So we'll just, um, I'm just gonna give, go through a little bit about these different kinds of bacteria just so you kind of understand you know, what probiotics are a little better. So lactobacilli is the genus of bacteria that has the most strains used for probiotics. This bacteria is found in a vast number of places. It is especially abundant on the leaves and roots of plants growing in or near the ground. It has 180 plus different strains, also, revert, also referred to as species, uh, and contains some of the most familiar names in the in the commercial world of probiotics, such as L. acidophilus, which is a strong probiotic found in the small intestine, urethra, and in women along the lining of the vagina and cervix. This strain of good bacteria sets up camp in these places to inhibit bad bacteria from adhering and multiplying. L. brevis is one of the main species found in water kefir grains and the species responsible for the formation of water kefir grains. It has been found to improve immune function as well as oral health. L. plantarum, commonly found in fermented vegetables like sauerkraut, pickles, and kimchi, creates a healthy barrier in your colon to keep dangerous bacteria from entering your bloodstream. The L in the beginning of each of these strains simply stands for lactobacillus. So, um, so that's, that's one of the main kinds of lactic acid bacteria. Another kind is bifidobacterium. It's another popular um, genus of beneficial lactic acid bacterium. So B. bifidum um, is present in the intestines of infants and is an indication of health in those infants. If you have more, that, that can be used to indicate it's been correlated with healthier infants have more of B. bifidum. It is used as a supportive therapy for intestinal infections and disturbances. It also has immune strengthening properties, particularly in relation to colon health, and it's suppressing effect on tumors. B. longum, this particular strain has been documented to counteract cancer-causing compounds in the colon, and um, it has been reported that it significantly, can significantly inhibit the development and growth of colon, liver, and breast cancers. B. breve found in both small and large intestines. This bacterium is essential for proper colon function. It is superior in its ability to break down ingestible plant fibers and also serves to inhibit pathogenic bacteria. It is also found in the vagina where it helps to inhibit overproduction of candida albicans, which is known as the primary cause of yeast infections in women. And so these are just the strains of bacteria that have been studied to use in commercially produced bacteria, uh, commercially produced probiotics. But there are, there are just, when it comes to probiotics, it's diversity that counts. And there are so many kinds that we haven't even studied yet, we don't know about, that are present in um, fermented foods that you make at home. And it actually is when you make these foods at home, they're actually more beneficial to you because you, they pick up bacterium from your home environment that's actually supportive. It's related to your microbiome, the bacteria in your home environment. So that's, that's another cool thing. So some more of the benefits of probiotics. Your body contains 100 trillion bacteria. So that's 10 times the amount of cells in your body, which perform a variety of important functions in your body including a key role in supporting the immune system. We need to have more, much more good bacteria than bad to stay healthy. It's all about having the right balance. You wanna have the good outgrow the bad. You're never gonna fully get rid of the bad, and you sometimes you need small amounts of bad bacteria, but you need to have the good be in a greater quantity. By consuming fermented foods, we are bringing in significant amounts of lactic acid producing bacteria. So the lactic acid deactivates the bad bacteria and allows the good bacteria to flourish. So I'd like to just, this is a common misconception about probiotics. You're not giving your gut new bacteria. You're not really like seeding new bacteria into your gut. 
most of the studies we've seen is you basically your your microbiome is set at birth. You get it from your mother, you get it from however you were born, and that's just kind of set by the time you're, I think it's three to five. So you also pick it up from your early childhood environment and from either breastfeeding or not breastfeeding. Um, but that is set. By the time you're an adult, your microbiome is set in terms of the variety of bacteria that you have. What you can control is supporting the growth of good bacteria or you know, suppressing the growth of bad bacteria. And so that is why probi that's how probiotics, either in you know, these lacto-fermented vegetables or in a supplement you would buy at the store, that's how the majority of them work. Um, oh no. My live video ended. I'm going to have to start a new one. Sorry. Sorry, I have to fix my Instagram. I hit an hour because I started my live video early. All right, I'll give it a second. I can't get that to work. But um, here we go. That's how you do it. Okay, I hit an hour, so I had to go over because I started a bit early. But that is, um, I lost my train of thought again. Sorry about that. That is how probiotics work. They're not giving your gut new strains of bacteria that doesn't actually happen, but they either encourage the growth of more, more encourage your good bacteria to grow more or stop your bad bacteria from growing. So inside our bodies, Lactic acid bacteria work in conjunction with our immune cells to support our immune system function. And they also stimulate mucus secretion in the gut, which provides protection to the intestinal walls, which really increases the health of those walls, which is important to nutrient absorption. They work with our body's natural processes to improve digestion and nutrient absorption. So, um, this is just some more about, I think we pretty much went through this. This is about sauerkraut um, specifically. Um, but the lactic acid, it can also activate secretions of the pancreas, which is particularly important for diabetics or people that have issues with blood sugar control. Um, sauerkraut also contains large quantities of choline, a, which is a nutrient that can lower blood pressure and regulate um, the passage of nutrients into the blood. Choline also aids in the metabolism of fats. And if you're deficient in choline, you can begin to accumulate fats in your liver. Um, sauerkraut also contains acetylcholine, which has a powerful effect on the parasympathetic nervous system, um, which is really important that your the parasympathetic nervous system is your sort of rest and digest mode. And you need to be in that calm state in order to properly have your digestive functions work. Um, it also can reduce blood pressure, slow down the rate of heartbeat, and promotes calmness of sleep. Um, and it has a beneficial effect on the peristaltic, which is just the movements of food through your intestines and, and can be helpful in constipation. So how do we bring these ferments into your diet? So you can either purchase them pre-made or make them for yourself. I definitely recommend making them for yourself. Um, so it's, it's like beyond easy to make these. All you need is to have your vegetable or fruits washed, cut up into sort of smaller pieces and mixed with salt, herbs, or spices. Um, and then either pounded or squeezed to release their juices. Um, then you, you take this mixture and you press it and pack it into an airtight container. And the salt acts to inhibit the putrefying bacteria for several days until the good bacteria multiply to a large enough number to produce the lactic acid, which in turn preserves the vegetables. Um, if you have issues with salt or you're trying to avoid salt in your diet, um, you can use a little whey to the mixture to reduce or even eliminate the salt. Um, this is because whey already contains lactic acid and lactobacilli, so it eliminates, it reduces the time interval required for the lactobacilli to multiply. So this is an extra step. It's not absolutely necessary. Again, if you're in quarantine and all you have is vegetables and some salt, 
you can still make this work. But um, using whey gives you more consistent results when making your cultures. Um, and it again, reduces the salt you need to add, which can be beneficial for some people. Whey is really easy to make. Um, there's sort of several different ways to make it. The easiest is to just take any kind of good quality, you know, organic yogurt and um, basically pour the yogurt into a cheesecloth. And then you tie up the cheesecloth and you just hang it from somewhere. And that allows the leftover liquid from the yogurt to drain out. If you've ever opened your yogurt and there's that liquid on top, that's whey. Um, so you can also just like pour that if there's enough. Typically you need about four tablespoons. So usually what's on top isn't quite enough. But that's the process to make whey. And then you can just store that in your fridge for several days. Um, but that's easy, but you know, sometimes that's not always available or certain people are, can't tolerate dairy. And so then you just use the salt and you just have to use a little bit more salt. Um, during the first few days to few weeks of fermentation, the vegetables are kept at room temperature to carry out the process. Afterward, they should be placed in a cool, dark place like your refrigerator or you know, root cellars were what were traditionally used for long-term storage. So you do need some sort of cool storage. They won't keep forever. I mean, it depends on the specific ferment you're making. Um, some ferments, they go for like 20 years. Um, there's a show on Netflix. It's called Flavorful Origin Origins. It's about like traditional Chinese foods. My husband and I really like it, but everything in that show has been fermented for at least seven to like 15 years. Um, so we make a lot of jokes about people just like forgetting something in a jar and then eating it. But that's like their ultimate prize foods. It's just like it's been left in a jar for 20 years and now it's just this amazing thing. You don't need to do that when you're making your ferments at home. Um, it's usually a few days um, and then you can put it in the fridge or if you have some sort of cool cellar, also like you can store them there as well. You should always try to use organic vegetables. I recommend getting your vegetables for your ferments from the farmer's market because they have the, they like should have, they have some dirt residue. Obviously you're gonna wash the dirt off, but they have more bacteria. Um, things in the grocery store, even organic, have gone through, they've been sanitized and stuff's been done to them. Um, so it's best to use um, organic vegetables, probably from the farmer's market, just like as, you know, clean as you can get them, a good quality sea salt, oops, and filtered or pure water. You don't want to have a water, like a, your tap water has chlorine in it, that's going to kill the good bacteria that you're trying to help grow. Typically for these, you're not even adding water, you're just using the natural juices from the vegetables themselves that you get out by crushing them. Um, and the lactobacilli, they need plenty of nutrients to do their best work and minimal toxins and impurities to produce the best results. So get the best quality produce that you can, um, you know, for what you have access to. So um, just so some notes on food waste, given we're just sort of in a time where food is feeling a bit harder to come by. I mean, there's, I think there's still plenty of supply for most people if you're, you know, if you're looking um depending on where you are but it, the situation's different all over the world so it's just good to think about ways to minimize food waste and making the most of what you have and lacto fermentation allows for long-term preservation of fruits and vegetables completely naturally and it allows you to preserve your food and actually increase its nutritional content by preserving it and some other just tips you know plan before you shop so um, make sure you have a plan when you're going to the store, because if you don't plan, you know, you're going to forget about that kale that you meant to cook because, you know, maybe you don't want to, you don't know how to cook kale. And then a week later, you find it slimy and gross at the back of your refrigerator. Or if you're like me, who just really struggles at making grocery lists, at least make a plan once you get home. So if you forgot to make a list, you just bought stuff at the store, that's fine. But once you get home, Take, take a few minutes to plan out some meals. At least make, at the very minimum, just a mental plan. Um, so you have an idea of how you're gonna use this food before it goes bad. Um, oops, sorry. Again, um, use the whole animal and the whole plant. So fruit peels and rinds can be used to make vinegars, 
Vegetable scraps can be used in soup, and meat bones can be used for broth. In traditional cultures, almost no food went to waste. So just try to look at your food a little differently. You know, there's no reason to only eat the breasts and the legs from the chicken. There's a lot more meat on that bird. There's ways to put it to use. And so sort of like uh, a recipe I'd like to share, this is just a frugal broth recipe. Um, that's something I like to make a lot in my home. So if you have a whole chicken or any other bone and cut of meat, you can, um, you know, either cut off the bones before you cook or cook and save the bones. Um, also, if your chick chicken comes with giblets, you can save the livers and actually, you know, it can take a, a few chickens to get enough livers, but you can make a delicious liver pate by sauteing them with some onions and butter and then blending them. Um, but reserve all the bones and then vegetable scraps that just naturally occur while you're cooking. So onion skins, broccoli stems, carrot ends, celery leaves, etc. cetera. Um, and you just keep that all in the freezer until you have around, uh, around six to eight cups. So then um, when you're ready to make your broth, you just saute those vegetable scraps in a large stew pot with some grass-fed butter or ghee or any, any good quality oil and you want them to be golden and fragrant, you add the bones and you cover the whole thing with at least four inches of filtered water. You bring that to a boil, you skim the scum from the surface of the water, and then you reduce heat to low and cover and leave to simmer for 12 to 24 hours. So this makes a delicious and nutritious um, bone broth, which we're not gonna talk about the benefits of bone broth today, but it's, it's a great food and then you can um, drink this with meals to add some more nutrients, you can use it to make Things like, um, things like squash or pumpkin soup and stews. Um, so you can either freeze it immedi immediately or store it in the fridge for up to five days. A another great thing you can do with this is sort of boil it down so it's really um, concentrated and then store it in like an ice cube tray and then you have your own easy to use bouillon cubes. Um, just and just you can just add that to anything to add some flavor to your meals add that to your rice add that to you know you name it so that sort of brings us to the end of what I want to discuss today I have a few helpful tools and resources these are some books that I would recommend um, nourishing nutrition's by Sally Fallon I think everyone should have this book in their home um, she gives you everything you really need to know about Nutrition and Preparing Traditional Foods. I really enjoy that book. Um, and there's tons of great recipes. Um, I, have it, I have it right here. So it's really, it's like this whole thing is recipes, recipes, recipes. It's a great book. Um, Traditionally Fermented Foods, that's another book specifically on fermented foods and baking sourdough. It's got a really great recipe for gluten-free sourdough, if that's something you would need. I like that book as well. Um, Our Journey with Food is a really great book just on if you're interested in food history like you know just the history of traditionally prepared foods and how we ended up with the foods we have today um, I would recommend giving that a read um, and then we have sort of the funky kitchen and um, wild fermentation are just some other just more resources good books on preparing fermented foods but if you have nourishing traditions that's she has the recipes for everything um, that you would need to bring these foods into your kitchen. Um, and, sorry, and there's just some, you know, some tools that you might, can be helpful when you're making these things. Again, that's that sprouting lid I was talking about. Um, clear, like mason jars at the very minimum, you just need a good supply of mason jars. You can get like fancy fermentation jars with these special lids that let out the pressure. You don't really need those. Um, if you're using a mason jar, you just have to remember to, you know, let out a little extra pressure every few days. But Cultures for Health is a website, and they store a store, a, a online store, and um, they sell things like sprouting seeds and sourdough starters and water kefir grains and yogurt starters. It's like anything you could possibly need if you want to start culturing food. Cultures for Health will have it on their website. And they also have a lot of great how-to guides that show you how to do, like, step-by-step, -step, take you through these different um, food processes. You know, and if you're just, 
you don't want to spend time in the kitchen or you, you don't have the patience to make these things, you can buy them. We're, it's, you know, and you can still reap the nutritional benefits of using these kinds of foods. You can just buy them pre-prepared. So Thrive Market is like an online, you can buy these at Whole Foods, at Sprouts. Thrive Market is a website I like. It's, um, it just gives you, you can get a lot of organic, you know, good kind of foods at a discount. Um, but you, you have things like, you know, sprouted seeds, sprouted flowers. Wild Brine is a good brand of pre-prepared um, lacto-ferments. The only, um, and then Proof is a local bakery in Arizona that makes amazing sourdough bread. And I would say, like, baking sourdough bread is an art. <laughs> it takes a lot of practice and just, like, to get it, you know, really good. It's, it's, it's not easy, I would say. Like, you can make a bread that looks like bread and tastes like bread pretty easily, but to, you know, have it be really refined um, and taste really good it's a bit of an art so i often recommend people just buy their sourdough bread proof is a wonderful local bakery that i i purchase from them they have amazing amazing breads you can also buy you know microgreens at the store um so these are all things that you can buy but you know if you're stuck at home right now anyway why not give it a try you probably have some extra time to spend in the kitchen um yeah and then and it'll just you'll save on cost it's a lot You'll, it's just a lot more affordable to make these things for yourself. So if cost is an issue for you right now, don't buy, you know, these wild brines are like six or seven dollars for the little jar and like a head of cabbage is like three or it, you're just going to save a lot of money. So that's really, that's everything I have for you today. Um, check your inbox. If you're on the Zoom, check your inbox. I have a digital handbook on, on the guidelines for soaking sprouting, souring, and lacto-fermentation. You should get that a bit later today along with the recording of this webinar. Um, again, if you want additional support with your diet and health, um, I can be contacted at info at radwayfunctionalnutrition.com. I also do free 20-minute consultations, and you can schedule one of those, again, at my website, radwayfunctionalnutrition.com dash work with me. Um, I really appreciate you guys taking the time um, to be here today and to learn about these um, just wonderful ways to prepare your food. And I can't wait to see how you use these, this knowledge to improve your own health. Um, I'm going to open it up to questions. So on Zoom, you can just pipe in, or if you're watching on Instagram, you can just type in a question. Um, if you're interested and yeah so thank you again that was one of my references so let me know if you have any questions oh i got the question Oops. thank you thank you anna thanks for watching Well, and I can wait a few more minutes if anyone thinks of any questions. And I appreciate Maddie asked some good questions earlier on in the discussion. I really appreciate those. So thanks for the participation, Maddie. Any recommendations for IBS? So that is, you know, for specifically treating IBS, that's something you'd have to discuss with your licensed medical provider. Um, I can't recommend, you know, like food-based treatments for IBS. These foods are very supportive of your overall gut health. So if you're having IBS issues, those are usually stemming um, from, um, issues higher up in your digestive system. So you're basically, often you're not able to properly break down your food. So having food that is easier di to digest by following these practices should be able to help reduce those symptoms and just improve the balance in your gut microbiome. I would, 
if you're someone that has a lot of GI complaints, start slowly, like very slowly, especially um, with things like lacto-fermented vegetables. So I would even start just doing like a teaspoon of just the brine um, and then working your way up to, you know, very small quantities. Lacto-fermented vegetables, they're always eaten in small quantities. So you wouldn't want to go ahead and like eat a cup of sauerkraut um, because that would just be, that is too much. You know, it's a question of balance. Just because a little bit is good doesn't mean a lot is better. Um, but yeah, I hope that answers your question. So I would definitely recommend, if you have the IBS, these foods will make your food easier to digest and that should, you know, help with your symptoms. And Christine is asking if we have access to the slideshow. Um, if you want the slideshow, um, you can email me. I'm not gonna be like publishing it anywhere. I am gonna be sending out everyone who's registered for the webinar will get a recording and the recording should show the slides. If you're interested in like a particular slide, just let me know, just send me an email, I can email it to you. Um, and then Jesse, Jessica's asking, about how much lacto fermented food to include in your day yeah so that's a good question and sort of like i was talking about earlier if you're just starting start with very small quantities and and it, it, it they are something that you can overdo so don't have a salad of sour like don't have a plate full of sauerkraut but you know two two or three tablespoons that that might even be too much depending where you're starting from but I would start with like a teaspoon and work your way up to like two, two tablespoons. Um, and you can have it with all of your meals if you want. Breakfast is a great meal. Traditional cultures typically have these foods with breakfast because often um, typically people need a little help like jump starting their digestion in the beginning of the day. So, um, but it's great. Any meal that let's say it's a really good thing to add if you know, the majority, if your meal is entirely cooked, just add a little bit of fermented food to it. So then you have those enzymes with that meal. It's gonna help with your digestion. Um, so I hope that answers your question, Jesse. Any food bad? Are there any, I think Jessica's asking, like, are there any foods that you shouldn't ferment? Um, Maybe she can clarify. I'm not quite sure what her question is, but um, are there, <laughs> she'll, she'll probably be tight. Um, there are some foods, things like tomatoes are really hard to ferment um, just because they're, I, I think it's because they're too acidic. Certain foods are harder to ferment and fruits you need to use whey in your fermentation just because um, you can't make the fruits as salty. And so, Oh, are there any bad, like, in terms of food combinations? Um, <laughs> just stop. I'm trying to think. Um, I, I, um, there probably are. I just, uh, nothing's coming to mind right now. Sort of the basics of food. Comp like, I wouldn't have, just if it seems weird, like, don't do it. But... I'm trying to think. Uh, pretty much anything can be fermented and you can add like a fermented sauce to pretty much anything. I'm not thinking of anything like blaring, like don't do this. I mean like putting sauerkraut on like ice cream, that just sounds weird to me. So that's probably, but I'm sure someone's done that. But um, yeah, not anything like very blatantly obvious that you should avoid. Just don't, don't do like crazy things. Do things that like kind of make sense and use recipes. Um, use the books like I've talked about. They'll, they'll show you sort of traditional ways foods were prepared and just copy those traditional recipes um, if you can. So, let's see. Oh, thank you, Naomi. I'm happy you enjoyed it. So, um, I have a few more minutes for questions. If there's any other questions, I can stay on. Oops. Lost my slideshow. There we go. Um, a few more minutes. Again, 
I do free consultations. If you want to learn more about how nutritional therapy can be supportive of your health in a you know one-on-one -on -one targeted fashion, I would love to hear from you. Um, and yeah, I'm planning on doing more of these webinars. So if there's any topics you're interested in learning more about, please, you know, leave a comment, send a message, and I'll, I'll you know, consider making a webinar about it. Um, and just follow me, you know, keep track on my Instagram. I'll be posting if there's anything new, I'll post it on my Instagram and my Facebook so you can know. Because, um, yeah, there's a lot of topics I'd like to share about. Now I'm going to drink some water. I see you, Jenna. I hope you're still there. Hi, Jenna. Oh, no, I broke it again. Don't break Instagram. A topic about skin and someone on Instagram is asking, is that Megan on Instagram was asking about doing a topic on gut health and skin. Definitely something um, I could talk about. Um, yes, I just scraped the surface on like the microbiome. I mean, there are so many things. It, you know, like your gut controls your brain. There's so much about the gut brain connection. It really is like integral to everything in your health. And I really just scraped the surface in this talk. So there's a lot of other areas we could go more in depth in if people are interested. So I'll be definitely be thinking about that. Thank you, Megan. There's a Mega Moa. I don't know if your name's Megan. I see Mega Moa. So I was assuming Megan, but it might not be Megan. So sorry if I got your name wrong. Well, I think we've got one more minute. So if you've got one burning question left. This is your time. You got one minute left to ask. And then I think that's pretty much our time for today. I really thank you all again, everyone who watched. <laughs> uh, okay, Moa. Sorry, Moa. Um, but yes, thank you for your questions, Moa. I appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Um, yeah, thank you, everyone. If you have any other questions that come to mind later on today, just send me an email. Again, my email is info at radwayfunctionalnutrition.com or you can message me on Instagram, uh, whatever you want to do. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to be here today and I look forward to sharing more information with you all in the future. So thank you everybody. Have a great day.